I got a few work-related stories from my hometown I can post. This first one happened when I was a 20-year-old college student. At the time, I worked in a, let's say, rustic-looking gas station. It wasn't a building by itself either, rather it acted more like a booth that was attached to a supermarket. The booth itself is located a bit off-site on the other side of this huge parking lot, but the supermarket owns it. The booth faces the store, but it has a huge woodland area directly behind it. The door to the booth faces left into the woods, and I know I'm being overly specific, but this is important. So the window in the booth is bulletproof, but only covers the front so you can't see directly to the left or right of the booth. At the time of this experience, I've been working at the station for maybe a few months, when all of a sudden, this nasty storm hit the area one night. The rain was so bad that you could barely see 10 feet in front of you, and it was flooding all over the place. But the supermarket, being desperate for money, refused to close the booth down, so I showed up for my typical 5 to 11 p.m. shift in the pouring rain. Three hours into my shift, the power goes out due to the storm, which by this point has gotten downright apocalyptic. It's pitch black out there, and the rain is coming down hard, so I decided to sit tight in the booth while I wait for a manager or something to either let me go or to fix the power. Of course, this means the phones are down, so I can't call in the store, and nobody in their right mind is buying gas, so I decided to start doing my booth chores like cleaning the counter, counting cigarettes, tidying the drawer, etc. Now, this next part will require a bit more background information, so bear with me. The booth itself is supposed to be locked at all times, but one of the new hires managed to break the key off inside the lock making one of our managers break the lock so we all could get back inside. That lock still hadn't been replaced, but we were told to pretend the door was still locked. The door still had a deadbolt, but I found it annoying to fool with, so I mostly just left it unlocked. Whenever I'd go to open the door, I'd pretend to put the key in and make an audible sound like a lock being opened. Anyway, back to me sitting in the unlocked booth in the pitch black pouring rain, I'm in the middle of my chores when I hear something outside the booth, like a muffled sort of splashing sound. Again, there is zero visibility, so I press my ear against the door and I can clearly hear someone walking around the booth, in the rain, before stopping in front of the door. Before I can kick myself for not locking it, I hear that ksh sound, followed by the most dreadfully quiet couple of seconds. I'm just waiting to die at the hands of some deranged serial killer or crackhead, when suddenly, the footsteps start splashing back into the woods. I quietly soil myself as I race to lock the deadbolt and I wait out my shift. I would occasionally hear the footsteps outside, but it never tried to open the door. Finally, my manager drives over in a truck to close me out for the night. Since I'm still kind of new here, I didn't want to seem like I was delusional or crazy or that I was a crackhead so I never mentioned it to him or anyone else at the store. A few months later, this kid I was training told me he'd heard footsteps real late one night during a storm, and thankfully, the lock had been replaced since then. I just tell him it was nothing, but not to open the door if he thinks there is something out there. Not because I didn't want to look delusional, but because I can't explain this phenomenon. Now fast forward a couple of months, and I'm still working at the booth. By this point... I'm the second oldest person working there, so sometimes I'd get calls from younger co-workers when they accidentally mess up. On this particular night, I was off, but I still got a call from this high schooler who I'll call Rhea. I look at the time and it's 9.30, so I sigh and pick up the phone, and before I can even get in a what happened, Rhea is in hysterics, saying something about her trainee being missing, and then lots of sobbing. Confused, if not a little agitated that she called me first, I try to get her to call the cops or something if he's been kidnapped, but she insists that she can't call the cops because they wouldn't believe her. So, my next line of thinking is to ask her why she hasn't told a manager, and she cries some more and says that they wouldn't understand. More agitated than confused, I agreed to go out there and calm her down. I get dressed, go out there, and park next to the booth. There were no customers around and the girl was just standing in the booth staring at the door. She spots me, opens the door and starts sobbing, telling me to hurry inside. 
Eventually, I got her to stop crying long enough to tell me what happened. Apparently, she was training this new guy, Matt, who was an older guy about my age, and she said, The dude felt off, like a robot or something, and kept staring at her all dazed. Several times he would stop talking mid-sentence and ignored her attempts to address it. At this point, she's getting real uncomfortable and is about to call into the store about him when he starts sort of humming, she says. She described it as kind of like as if someone was attempting to imitate a purring cat, like they were breathing heavily and buzzing at the same time. So she reaches for the phone, and he reacts by grabbing her hand and just staring at her. She starts bawling at this point, begging him to stop, and he lets go of her hand, then opens the door and just sprints off into the woods out of sight. She said he came back a few minutes just before I got there and asked to be let back in, but she refused, so he just ran back into the woods. At this point, I'm either thinking he picked up on the meth phase that the neighborhood was slinging around or that she's being dramatic. Regardless, the story sounded pretty dangerous and we needed to call the cops or something at least. I tell her we're going to call the cops and then we're going to walk outside and wait for them, but she doesn't want to go outside. She says that she can almost feel him waiting out there. Tired, irritated, and not really buying the story, I just say screw it. She can stay in the booth and call the cops while I make sure the tree line is clear. I take this weak little flashlight that I stashed out there after the first story and go outside to start scanning the tree line. I barely begin shining the light around when, suddenly, the hair stands up on the back of my neck as I hear this humming noise. She described it rather well, too, because it sounded kind of like cicadas mixed with breathing. I look inside the booth and she's curled up in the chair, staring to my left. I didn't even look where she was staring, I just immediately booked it back to get inside. But I left the keys with her, and she's not getting up to let me in. I'm pounding on the door while screaming at her to let me in, and the humming stops abruptly as I hear something behind me and to the left. It's Matt. He's standing just on the edge of the trees. My panic intensifies, and at this point... Rhea finally lets me into the booth, and I immediately deadbolt the thing shut. All of a sudden, Matt is right outside asking to be let back in. He says he's sorry, and that he got a bit nervous back there, and he begins circling the booth while he just repeats the same couple of excuses, asking to come in. This continues for maybe five minutes before the cops arrive, and Matt just begins to run off into the woods again. I end up having to explain to both the cops and our manager what happened, leaving out the weird humming. As far as I know, Matt never showed up, so they fired him and Rhea quit eventually, and that was the end of it. I was never particularly close to Rhea since she was still in high school when I was in college, so we never got to talk about what happened. I have no idea what happened that night though. Maybe Matt was just some doped up meth junkie who was capable of making some really weird noises. I'll never know. I guess it could explain why he bolted out of there when the cops began to show up, but that day is still quite a mystery to my mind. I'm originally from Belarus, although I live in the United States now. I got my first job under the table in the early mid-90s, I was 12 to 13 and my job was being a helper in my father's barber shop, mostly sweeping up hair, cleaning the bathroom, taking out trash, that sort of thing. We lived, along with our shop, near the border with Poland. Lukashenko had just come to power and the Soviet Union had dissolved. These were very difficult times for everyone. Mass starvation and poverty swallowed the land. In fact, these problems still exist there today. But back to the story. I was at the barber shop with Papa, and we only really get the same few regulars since most people cut their own hair or have a family member do it. Maintaining a barber shop was really one of the only things possible during the Soviet Union. The day goes by and it's beginning to get dark. I'm told to clean up the shop, take out the trash, and then to come right home. After being lectured, Papa leaves me alone in the barber shop to go drink by myself somewhere. I finish my chores, I lock the door and finally begin walking home. 
Now this is a pretty rural area, not exactly like the countryside, but everything is very spaced out. Hard to maintain a community around here, so everyone sort of sticks to their own privacy. As I'm walking home, I realize that I forgot to take out the garbage and I turn around to go back. When I turn around, I suddenly noticed a LADA, a rather popular Russian vehicle, had been driving behind me with no lights on. Actually, I believe they were coasting as there was no sounds of the engine humming and we were also going slightly downhill. Since I'm going back my route, I'm now going uphill and the car passes me by and I feel somewhat at ease. Suddenly, the Lada gets to the bottom of the hill, cranks the engine on and makes a U-turn. They pull up beside me and I can see that it's a man and a woman inside. The man driving asks me if I want to lift to my location, but I tell them no thanks, that it's not far, and that, well, they are severely creeping me out. They get offended that I told them they are creeping me out and begin to yell at me, calling me all sorts of nasty things, telling me they hope I slip and crack my head open. Figuring they were possibly just drunk, I tell them to F off and cut through the grass and trees and I got off the road. I take a shortcut through this little wooded area that eventually will link back to the street on the other side, but by that point, some time should pass. Yet when I get there, the lot of from before is now idling on the road. I won't lie, at this point I'm getting extremely agitated. I come from a home with an alcoholic father and was sort of a slob squat. I was quite used to confronting adults and with my attitude, it also meant that I had been getting beaten by adults as well, so these random people acting all tough didn't scare me so much. I know it's edgy, but I don't know. You get used to it. You can read a person on whether or not they're actually going to attack a child or not, and you'd be surprised by how many actually do. Filled with anger, I walk up directly to the car and ask the man, Hey, what are you following me? You like me or something? You want me, huh? You want a kid? Why don't you go F your sister or whatever that is in there with you? Why don't you leave me alone? The man pauses for a second and puts his hand up to the window, holding a gun or something that looks like a gun. It was dark and I couldn't see very well, and he says, You can either have a good night or your last. If you get in the car, we can drive around a bit, have some vodka, have some fun. But if you don't, I'll kill you right here. Ironically, while I've been in fistfights with adults before, I've never been confronted with a gun. I don't know what to do at this point, but I know that there's no way I'm getting in this freak's car. And I hesitate for a moment before I say, Okay. Okay, I'll get in. And act like I'm going along with the plan. I go to the passenger side and the woman gets out to let me in. I believe she was going to say something like, Good boy, but as she got out of the car, I kicked her in the leg as hard as I could and started running. She yelped and fell over and by the time they knew what happened, I was back in the trees. It was a circular wooded area that was surrounded by roads, sort of like a large roundabout, but I could get to the center where they couldn't see me. They wouldn't know which side I would come out on, so I sit and wait in the middle for a while before deciding enough time had passed and I come out the side nearest the barber shop. I sprint from the woods up the road into the shop. I unlock the door, jump inside, lock the door, and stay there for the entire night. In the morning, my father showed up to the shop and beat me for never coming home. And I tried to explain what happened with the kidnapped attempt and even tried describing the car, but he got even angrier. He just accused me of lying, saying that I was using what I saw in the news to make up a lie. Yeah, by the way, this is unfortunately common. Not an everyday thing, but it got to the point that reported kidnappings were as common as car break-ins in America, if you want a comparison. Apparently, these two had gone around the whole village, asking any kids they saw if they wanted a lift, and there were reports of them making threats, etc. The exact profile of what happened to me. After my experience, I paid close attention to the news in hopes of these people getting caught, but instead, I only read headlines about children going missing, and how there was an abundance of missing kids from the past few months. It was assumed that the children had their organs harvested or were trafficked to other countries or were killed and eaten in response to the mass starvation. Unless you were like my family or were relatively wealthy by the standards of the day, it was very likely that you didn't eat much, if at all.
I barely remember being six. I barely remember first grade or what my favorite shirt was, but I do remember when I met the man who borrowed our sleeping bags. My dad is a very wonderful, kind man and always has been. So when one of his best friends asked if his brother could borrow some camping equipment for the weekend, my dad instantly helped. Charles came over and I floating beside my dad wondering in my six-year-old brain what he was up to without me. He let Charles borrow a few sleeping bags along with some other items. I live in Washington state and it tends to rain a lot here so he said that he'd be camping out in his van. My dad saw him off and that was that for a few days. Now Charles was a piece of work. A few nights later he went to a party where bountiful amounts of meth was provided along with whatever else. Two homes sat beside each other so the adults left the sleeping kids in one house and continued the party at the other. Charles left the party and decided that he would go next door. He knocked on the window of Kayla, a six-year-old girl who knew Charles well. He told her that he had a new puppy and wanted her to see. He led her to the van and you can see where this was going. Charles brutally murdered Kayla, stuffed her in one of our sleeping bags and headed to our house. He pulled up at around 10 p.m. or so asking my dad for gas money. Now my father doesn't get mad often but this infuriated him. He yelled, what are you doing here? My children are sleeping and my wife is here, you need to leave. I don't have any money for you. Charles said a few more things to my dad and took off in his van, high as a kite and the whole time having Kayla inside his van, deceased. A few days later, my mom and dad saw our sleeping bags on the news as evidence in the murder, and my parents instantly called 911 and gave them all the information they could. My parents ended up testifying in court about it that night. Even though they were together at that point, this was something very important for them to attend regardless of their dislike for the other. I remember my mom crying, saying Kayla and I were the same age, and that it was devastating that she lost her life so young and in such a brutal manner. I met Charles that day when he came to our house. I remember him. I remember everything about this murder because my mom made sure I never misunderstood what people would do. You can find my dad and mom in the court hearing information in a local paper at the time for the testimony that they'd given. I always think about Kayla how she would have looked if she would have had kids. I never met Kayla, but she has been a very important part of my life and others. You can't trust others all the time, especially not around your children. Ten years ago, I was in the Army, stationed at Fort Benning in Georgia. In Georgia, there can be a load of completely random thunderstorms in the summer. They really do just come out of nowhere. The sky can be blue and sunny with barely a single cloud in the sky and then 20 minutes later, you would think you're in the worst storm of your life. When these storms approach, the base would issue lightning warnings. They would blow their air sirens and all personnel on the base were supposed to get inside for safety. We were out in the field doing some pre-deployment tasks and were heading in to get cover. As we were in the middle of doing that, a soldier about 50 meters away all of a sudden got struck by lightning. It was hands down one of the most disturbing things I'd ever seen. To watch a man, a human being, just get slaughtered by something no one had control over within milliseconds. He had a family too, and he was a good dad and husband which just made it even worse. After the fact, I wasn't aware the effects of getting struck by lightning could vary Many people actually survive with some degrees of burns and scars. Not him. He was completely turned inside out and unrecognizable. Even though we knew who he was, obviously they still had to identify the body via dental records. That's just how torn apart he was. Speaking of spontaneity, people also need to be more concerned with lake trips and vacations. It's not as wonderful as commercials and advertisements make them out to be. People need to remember that anything can happen, at any time, on any day, and sometimes for seemingly no reason at all. It's just fate, I guess. For example, I used to work at this park with a lake as a main attraction. One day it was really peaceful out in the lake. The park wasn't packed, which was surprising. And then boom, all of a sudden, a dude drowned after falling out of his paddle boat. The death itself was already horrible, but 
what made it even more morbid was that he was there with a school group for their last summer vacation, along with his family too. So I experienced not only a dead body, but also ended up seeing young children coming to grips with human death for the first time. One of the friends of the deceased tried to fight with the park rangers because he thought they didn't try hard enough. To be fair, they tried the best they could, and the friend had to be dragged away by police. Another girl had told the deceased to wear a life jacket, which he didn't, and ended up blaming herself for not pressing the issue hard enough. One of the guys who ran the boat's rental heroically dove into the lake to pull up a girl, who was also without a life jacket, that was in the boat with the deceased when they fell, and he no doubt saved her life. When the family of the deceased finally saw the confirmation of the body, they almost immediately began wailing and howling in remorse, forming a tight circle to provide some measure of support. A crowd had gathered to watch the police fish the poor guy out of the lake, then a fight broke out because someone was smoking and another took offense. There really isn't an end to the story. They took his body out of the lake and then everyone reacted in whatever ways their brain enforced. Anger, dread, and grief. When it was supposed to be simply some kid's classroom's last day of school before their big summer break. At the time of the story, I was a 20-year-old Croatian student looking for a summer job to get some cash before college starts. One day, a friend that lives on one of the islands in Croatia tells me about a captain of a tourist ship who was looking for crew members. I've always liked boats and felt at peace when I was out in the waters, so this seems like the opportunity for me. I end up learning that there's only two people working on the boat, the captain and some friend of his. Of course, the captain's buddy is good for nothing and only got the job because he's the captain's friend. The captain probably just wanted the company as he is a very experienced sailor who ended up teaching me everything. I work 12 hours every day, mostly alone because the other guy is always drunk or hungover and doesn't even show up. The pay isn't much and the job is even more difficult since I do 90% of the work. The captain has to steer the ship so he obviously can't help me. However, I still love every minute of it. When I get free time, I talk with the tourists and try to score with the ladies. End of summer approaches, and it's my last week on the ship, so I give the captain my notice so he can find a replacement. He finds some chubby, inexperienced kid to replace me and asks me to teach him everything. I felt a little annoyed, but also definitely felt good to pass down my knowledge that I learned firsthand from the captain. At this point, I haven't seen the buddy on the ship for a week now. So, the kid is basically useless, but he's got heart, which I can respect. I try to teach him to tie the ropes after leaving port, but the kid just can't seem to get the hang of it. One day, we sail out on strong winds, and the captain puts me on horde control so tourists don't get jumpy. Meaning my hands are full, and the kid is on his own. Meaning the kid has to tie ropes, and well, he doesn't. We barely get off the coast when a tourist accidentally knocks the rope over while nobody's watching. The rope then gets tied up in the propeller, and the ship suddenly stops. And now, we're adrift in the middle of nowhere, and the wind is beginning to wreak havoc on us. The captain tells me to go under and cut the rope free. Now, I don't know how deep it was where we were, but the water was pitch black when looking from the ship. Nevertheless, it was that, or we drift for hours, or sink due to wind. I take my shirt off and jump into the freezing water and the cap throws me the mask and a knife. I swim to the propeller and start cutting at the ropes, when I begin to feel like there was this constant feeling that something is watching me. Not someone, something. I stop, come up for air as the rope was quite thick, and that feeling fades away. I catch my breath and dive back down and look into the deep. All of a sudden, like a snap of your fingers, the feeling is back. Something is down there, and I begin to panic, and I start cutting as fast as I can, looking around to see if I can find anything. Finally, I look down while cutting, and something big floats beneath me. The water was dark, but I clearly saw a shadowy figure move under me. I'm still panicking and cutting, and I end up slicing my hand, but the rope finally snaps. Whatever it was, 
It felt like Cthulhu itself was about to snatch me and tear me apart. I rip the rope from the propeller and swim to the surface. I don't even use the stairs, I just climb onto the ship using the anchor. And the captain looks at me and says, Hey, what happened? You're bleeding, you okay? I don't answer, and the captain looks at my face and just goes silent. I guess I was in shock and had that thousand yard stare, and it almost seemed like he knew exactly why. Like he'd seen something before. He takes me to the ship hold as the tourists are cheering me like I saved the country or something. Meanwhile, I can't even get my breath back because of the fear that I felt. The captain patches me up and gives me the rest of the day off, says he and the kid will take care of the hoard and doesn't ask what happened. And the next day, I quit. The captain is sad, but says he understands. But fast forward to two years, I've never stepped foot back on a ship after that experience. I have this massive fear of the depths, and I can't even swim more than a hundred meters from the shore before this deep anxiety kicks in. I even have nightmares about it, and of course, nobody believes me when I tell them. Maybe now I can finally understand the captain's buddy and why he was vanishing constantly. Maybe that's why he was drunk all the time. So yeah, I worked a dream summer job on a ship, had to fix my replacement's accident, saw an unexplainable figure in the deep void and never went on a ship again, and went from loving the ocean and the deep blue to being completely petrified of simply swimming. I've got work in a little bit, but I'll share some stories. I was born and raised in God's country, Lafayette, Louisiana, but my dad's side of the family is all Appalachian Mountain folk, I mean, they are 100% American-bred country bumpkins, the kind you can barely understand when they talk to you. They're good people, though, and great storytellers, so I grew up listening, wide-eyed, to their crazy tales of mountain witches and other kinds of beings in the woods. For example, when I was really young, my dad used to cut our hair. He scooped it up and then would go out into the woods for a little while. I never questioned this until one day my youngest brother got his first haircut. As usual, Dad cut it and when he was done, he'd scoop up the hair off the ground like he always did. This time, however, our grandfather was there in the room. He spoke up and said, Make sure to bury it. And my dad nodded and went out into the woods. I was about ten by this point and I had never been told that Dad was burying our hair, so I asked about it and Grandpa said that witches use your hair to cast spells on you. He said that you've got to go out where no one can see you and dig a hole and bury it. Otherwise, witches will use it to curse you. My grandpa is shocked that I've never heard that before, as if it's a completely normal thing for anyone to know. He then asked me, didn't your dad ever explain how to tell if a witch made a curse out of your hair? I tell him no, sir. And he explains that witches can put spells on bits of human hair to make a person sick or to make them do things. Occasionally, this will result in a hairball, he says. I'm thinking that he means like the kind of hairball that a cat hawks up, but he describes it as a big, tangled up wad of hair. It just appears like out of thin air, wherever you are. It sounds obviously fake, but he calls my older cousin over who was staying with us at the time. Hey, tell him about the time you found a hairball. My cousin's eyes go wide. He begins to go on this rant saying that during one morning he was at the breakfast table talking to his brother. They were sitting across from each other when a big wad of hair just materialized out of thin air. They watched it apparently manifest right in front of their eyes before it floated over towards my cousin. Those witch balls can burn your skin, he told me. So he grabbed a pair of tongs and plucked it out of the air, careful not to touch it, then he tossed it into a fire. I asked him if anything ever happened after that, but he said no. I asked if he'd ever been burned by one of those hairballs, and he said no, but that his friend had. Apparently, this friend was out on his farm one day when he heard a cow mooing in the woods. Thinking one of his cows escaped, he followed the noises until he came to a small clearing, but there was no cow there. All of a sudden, as his friend described it, a bunch of witch balls appeared out of thin air and encircled him. He knew what they were immediately and took off running, but he ran into a few on his way out, and the next day, 
His face and arms and neck were covered in these huge burns. Look kind of like road rash, he said quietly. Afterwards, my grandfather told me to be careful about my hair, and from then onward I always made sure Dad buried my hair if he cut it. I know it's all imaginary folklore now, probably to keep hair from clogging drains or something, but good God if I still don't do it myself. Here's another one from Grandfather. There's apparently some strange phenomenon that happens before some people die. They just call it the knocking. Every time before someone died, they hear a tapping at the front door. The tapping always stopped as soon as someone went to check on it, but the next day, someone in that house would be dead. Sometimes only the person who was about to die would hear it, but usually multiple people would hear it, and apparently it happened to someone in my family, one of my dad's cousins. He was outside with a bunch of friends and family when they all heard someone pounding on the front door of the house. They looked over, but no one was there. They figured maybe one of the kids had gone inside and was playing around, so they got back to talking. The pounding started again, and my dad's cousin went over to tell the kids to stop messing around, but again, nobody was there. He closed the door and began walking towards everybody in the yard when the knocking came again, this time quieter. My dad's cousin looked back and nothing was there. My grandfather said everyone got spooked because they all knew that this meant that there was going to be a death in the family, and the next day, my dad's cousin was found in his bed, dead, with no apparent causes. Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. I used to be in the Navy, stationed on the Aegis-class guided missile cruiser. One day at sea, I'm taking a break on the flight deck, which was just behind the rear Aegis radar array, and I noticed all these dead birds all over the flight deck. It didn't take me too long to realize that these birds had flown in front of the radar and were more than likely microwaved to death. Thus, this gave me an idea. I figured if the heat works on birds, it should work on popcorn. A microwave's a microwave, right? So the next time we pulled into port, I went and got some microwave popcorn. Unfortunately, my shopping trip coincided with, at the time, Super Bowl Sunday, so the microwave popcorn was gone, along with just about every other salty snack in the store. All they had left was Jiffy Pop. I didn't even know they still made Jiffy Pop. Anyway, science waits for no man, so I returned to the ship and stashed the popcorn in my shop. During our next outing, I begin my conjuration. I tied some string to the handle of the Jiffy Pop pan and snuck out onto the weather deck. Just forward of my shop was a ladder that led to the deck that was overlooking the radar array. Normally it is closed off during radar operations for safety reasons, so I climb up there and lower the Jiffy Pop down in front of the array. Boom. The Jiffy Pop explodes immediately, showering the flight deck with burned popcorn. I pull the burst pan up, wind up my string, and chuck the entire apparatus over the side before running back into my shop. No sooner do I walk in the door than the phone rings. It's CICS, or the control center, also referred to as the war room. The officer in charge wants me to go out on the weather deck and look behind us and tell him if anything's there. I do. There isn't, obviously, and I tell him so. He hangs up, swearing. Later that night, I heard about a story from a friend of mine who was in CICS at the time, acting as a radio man. It turns out that the Jiffy Pop pan had actually reflected the radar waves, something I didn't even think about since the pan was made out of aluminum and metal. For those who aren't familiar with radar operation, a radar array sweeps back and forth, radiating waves the whole time. The waves are then reflected back to the array by anything they hit, such as planes, other ships, etc., when I lowered the pan down, the reflection falsely told the radar how big the object was and how far away it was. The problem, however, comes with the wavelengths involved. At too close of a distance, an object can show up on the radar as being at a different distance than it really is, or a different size. My Jiffy Pop pan appeared on the radar as a three-mile-wide contact, a hundred yards off the stern, and was only on screen for a couple of seconds before disappearing. The office in charge was freaking out about it, 
and had called up the Air Force to report a miscellaneous object. So, in the end, my curiosity about the microwave properties of an Aegis radar caused a U.S. Navy warship to file a false UFO report. Of course, I kept my head down the rest of the time on board, and I didn't tell anyone I was involved until long after I got out. Several years ago, my dad broke into an abandoned house in our neighborhood on a somewhat drunken impulse. While there, he claimed to have heard a disembodied voice speaking in Japanese, only to find out later that the last occupant of the house was indeed Japanese. We lived in a town with a pretty much non-existent Asian community and the house had laid empty for years since the occupant's death in the house. If he did not hear a ghost in that house, then I don't know what it could have been. He fled the house that night with a single trophy of his escapade, an old vintage metal pitcher. For years after this, the pitcher rested on a shelf in our house with no incident. However, the incident started after my parents divorced. My siblings and I were all adults at this point, out of the house and on our own. The divorce was messy and full of emotional distress, and my mother was left alone in the house. That was when the incidents began. For weeks, my mother would hear strange noises and banging sounds emanating from the room where the picture was kept. They only stopped when my brother took the picture and kept it in his apartment, which he shared with a girlfriend. Seemingly like before, nothing happened until my brother and his girlfriend hit what he described as a rough patch. They experienced the same strange sounds and banging noises in this time of anger and sadness, which began to suggest a correlation. Emotional distress triggers or fuels the strange occurrences. I myself took the picture next. I shared a house with several other people and though there was plenty of emotional distress, I can't say for certain that I experienced anything. Of course, there were enough odd noises and banging sounds from more natural sources that I'm not sure I would have noticed if there was anything to experience. Everything would have just blended together for me. I moved out of the house to live with my current girlfriend leaving the picture behind and more or less forgetting about it until a few days ago. Recently, there has been a new development. I recently hired one of my former roommates who was ignorant of the picture's history and did in fact barely know it existed. We were talking about weird memories and unsettling things and he told me of something he couldn't explain. With working two jobs, my former roommate, who we'll call Charlie, keeps odd hours and sleeps whenever he catches a chance. Recently, Charlie was awakened by sounds from the living room. It seemed to sound like another roommate, who we'll call Ashley, talking to someone. He said he distinctly heard two voices. Charlie told me he was confused because it was very late and he was unaware of any visitors. He stepped out into the hall, just in time to see Ashley step into her bedroom, followed by a tall figure dressed in black. Charlie thought it was a friend of theirs named David and asked Ashley about it the next day. Confused, she told him David didn't visit last night. In fact, no one did and that she went to her bedroom alone. Charlie told her that he could hear them talking, before Ashley staggered out saying that she could actually hear Charlie talking to someone at roughly the same exact time. She too heard two distinct voices, only they seemed to be coming from his bedroom. So as far as I know, this is the first time anyone has seen any sort of apparition relating to the picture but Ashley's bedroom is right next to the laundry room, which is where I left the picture. I told him to bring the picture up to work on his next scheduled day. If he does, I'll follow up with another thread, maybe get a Ouija board and hold a seance or something. I'm open to suggestions. No one has yet tried to actually evoke any sort of haunting from this thing, but I intend to try. Idaho is the scariest place that you have never given a second thought about. First off, there are about one and a half million people in a landmass that's about half the square mileage of California. That's not a lot of people. About 90% of the state is wilderness. I mean, you could easily hide a body here and it's doubtful anyone would come across it anytime soon, if you went deep enough. 
few things off the top of my head, there are at least two military caches in the state. According to my aunt, who works for the Forest Service, she had to visit one while enlisted and has since been back for some reason while being in the Forest Service. She says that since World War II, the United States has hidden caches of arms in the state to be used in a guerrilla warfare campaign if we were ever invaded. Speaking of which, the Idaho National Laboratory is federally funded and where the first nuclear power was ever generated to power a city. They keep that place under lock and key and there are rumored UFO sightings all the time. The hometown was about 50 miles away from that place and a wave of silent hovering triangles were reported a few years back. Most of the time, people would describe them heading from the west in the same direction as the laboratory site. My own UFO sighting, which got me interested in the paranormal, was part of this flap. And of course, it was heading from the west, passed over silently and low, and went east towards Wyoming. Further on the INL, someone close to me who was formerly in the Air Force was driving home through the desert after a trip to the western half of the state. For reference, State Highway 33 runs parallel with the southern border of the INL site for many miles. It's eerie out there, no towns for 30 miles and nothing but sagebrush. So he comes across this scene that was totally lit up by floodlights when he was right on the border of the INL site. He then blinked and somehow, half an hour of time had suddenly passed. He only talked to me about this once. Continuing from that UFO incident, I became quite the explorer of the paranormal through my late teens. Naturally, I segued into ghost hunting eventually. I spent a lot of time hunting for ghosts and I can tell you that some places are genuinely haunted and yes, some are complete hoaxes. There are many places that are haunted that you would never expect around Idaho, but there is one place I'll never go alone and I doubt I would go period. Little Butte Cemetery is a place not to be taken lightly. Typically, cemeteries are places that are pretty peaceful and most stories of hauntings there are fabrications. This cemetery though, an exception can be made. It's filled with spirits, mostly mundane, probably people that have passed that are lost. I know that there are child spirits there, or at least something that is very good at mimicking a child. But there is one spirit there that is particularly frightening. He appears as a well-built, vaguely hooded, almost seven-foot shadow figure. Unfortunately, my fellow ghost hunter friends and I attracted this thing to us for a few months. I think it could be a guardian spirit, but most likely I think it's a malevolent spirit that feeds on fear. It followed us for a while. We'd see it standing on street corners and buildings for months. After a while, I think we stopped giving it what it wanted and haven't seen it for about eight years now, thankfully. Many people have gone to this place to investigate since then, and I won't lie. I like to feel that I turned it into an urban legend of sorts. That thing has become something of a legend. There's many other hauntings throughout the state. Not all I've checked out. Boise's Egyptian Theater is extremely haunted, as is the state penitentiary. Near Preston, there was an Indian massacre near the turn of the century, and now on the site you can hear crying and sometimes see apparitions. I could go on, but suffice to say that nearly every town has that place or story, sometimes multiple ones. I'm sure that you have all figured out that I'm from the eastern half of the state. For whatever reason, East Idaho has had tons of reports of satanic or pagan activity, at least since the late 80s. Now I know what you're thinking, that's just a byproduct of the satanic panic, a hokey urban legend because everyone saw Satan everywhere at that time in a place known for its Mormon extremism. But the stories keep popping up, and have been for 30 years, at least until the late 2000s. One example comes from a friend from school, he lived way out in the boonies, about 10 miles out of town. He came across a group of people on his land, all wearing robes and chanting. They were in the process of killing all his hens, nailing them to trees. He grabbed his gun and took a shot at them and they took off. This guy was a straight shooter, a bit of a redneck with not much of an imagination so I do lean towards believing the story. Another anecdote comes from his friend's uncle. We got on this topic one night and he got very somber and proceeded to tell us about his experience. Similar to my friend, the uncle came across a group in the late 80s performing some sort of ritual on his property. 
north of Idaho Falls at the time. He took a running start with a rebel yell to tackle at least one of them, and they took off at what he described an inhuman speed. One that he was chasing jumped over a chain-link fence in one bound. Either Satan has an Olympian for a homeboy or something more sinister was going on. You could tell this genuinely scared him, and I knew him very well. He is not a person to take lightly. Stories like this are all over eastern Idaho, of occult groups making their presence known in the boonies. It seems a lot of the old timers in town have anecdotes like these ones, so either it's actually happening, or a lot of people are lying. I've got a weird story. It's nothing super wild, but it weirded me and my girl out for long enough that we still talk about it. My morning routine is always the same. Wake up, shower off, drink coffee, and head out. So that morning, I'm taking a shower, sitting in the tub feeling like even a full pot of coffee won't wake me up this morning when, all of a sudden, I get this rush of immense dread. I tried to rationalize it, but there was nothing detrimental happening with my work that had caused me to feel this intense. And I realized that I feel like someone is on the other side of the curtain. I get a little annoyed, but try to shrug off the confused panic that was settling in for seemingly no good reason. Yet I couldn't shake off this dread. It seriously felt like someone was going to poke their head in and stare at me and I could not shake this feeling. Somehow, I feel like I already knew what they look like as my rational side begins to wonder if there was something leaking into the water pipes causing me to feel this way. Suddenly, the feeling begins to become unbearable, and I open the curtain against my best interest. The feeling simply disappears, and I'm left feeling just severely weirded out. I quickly finish washing off and proceed throughout my day. Now fast forward a couple of weeks. At this point, this feeling happened to me a couple of times, maybe five times in total. One afternoon, my wife says, I have a weird question. Do you ever get a weird feeling in the shower like you're being watched? It was so specific that I couldn't help but begin to feel like I was going to wet myself. Keep in mind, I've never told anyone about this experience before, so I tell my story about what I've experienced and nervously laugh off how weird it was that she brought it up. It almost feels like you know what he looks like, right? She says as we hash out more details. My brain kind of haywires for a second and I instantly take a step back. This isn't just a coincidence anymore. She's describing my exact dread moments word for word. Yeah, like a man with a crazed smile and eyes too wide and if you wait too long he'll open the curtain. I managed to say back. We similarly freak out together and realize that something's weird if not straight up wrong with the bathroom. And this went on for a while, but with less frequency, until one day, it just stopped. We still talk about this to this day because it was so obscure. No clue what it was about, and we're both not super into ghosts or whatever, but we couldn't deny that weird experience though. Another quick one-time experience we had was during a late night after some laughs on YouTube and wine. Feeling the buzz of the wine, we decide to start watching horror movies and mysteries and enjoy the good spooky mood in the air. Soon, we started chatting about what makes a good horror story as we were bored of the LARPs and the videos. Suddenly, we both get this weird vibe about the room. I joke about how we're manifesting spookiness into reality, but she shushes me and asks me if something is outside. We lived on the top story of our complex at the time and the window overlooked a bunch of trees. It was nothing fancy and not as fun or nature-esque as it sounds. The trees are slightly diseased from growing in a water runoff and they squeak and squeal in the wind. I take a look and there's nothing outside except the sickly trees. She just kind of sits there, blank expression on her face. There's something outside, she says. I look again. And just like before, there's nothing of note there. <sighs> I think you might be drunk, babe. Here, let's just listen to music and change the mood. I say with false confidence, I'm not going to lose my shot at a good night over some spookiness. Just close the blinds, please. She mutters. Fine, 
If it means I can move the night on, I'll close the blinds, I think to myself. I stand up to close the blinds, and they suddenly fall right out of the window just as I go to reach for that little rope. We exchange confused and freaked out looks, and she jumps away from the window. That's not coincidence, I say, beginning to drunkenly put the blinds back up, but now she's too freaked out to let it slide. The night does eventually go on, with me telling her that I must have just drunkenly pulled too hard, but I know I didn't. I barely even had my finger around the string before the whole blinds collapsed. And we spent the night trying to ease ourselves, but both kept looking out the window, occasionally. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, watch out for witch balls. They burn.